Welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley School of Craft in Layton, New Jersey. And I'm so happy to welcome everyone here to see Bud Scheffel's lecture here about his kinetic sculpture. So I'd like to, first of all, thank all of our funders that make our programming happen and all of our supporters that are here tonight participating in this talk. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to Bud. So Bud Scheffel is a world-class professional artist specializing in the construction of kinetic sculptures, mobile, stabiles, and custom commission work. He has over a thousand successful exhibitions to his credit and is an award-winning artist that continues to expand his vision of contemporary art, but is recognized as one of the top mobile designers in the country and has been featured on all social media platforms and a variety of published articles and TV broadcasts for nearly 40 years. Originally from New York and now living in Delray Beach, Florida, he's traveled the world extensively living throughout Europe and Asia where he was inspired by the architecture and the beauty of the natural world. Bud's body of work has been so showcased in the Smithsonian Institution, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Chicago Botanical Gardens, and a broad range of other nationally recognized art establishments. Bud has been commissioned to create and install large scale industrial projects throughout the United States. And he can often be found showcasing his work at the Peters Valley Craft Fair, which we're hosting September 24th and 25th in, at the Sussex County Fairgrounds. A um, couple of things, this is a webinar. And so if you have questions, please, if, if you're not familiar with um, Zoom, if you scroll down to the bottom, there's a little section that says Q&A. So if you post your questions in there, when Bud is done doing his presentation, we'll ask, we'll read off the questions if we have time. And in the chat, Rachel, Rachel, who's our registrar at Peters Valley and manning this whole show, she will be uh, posting information about Bud's website and his social media links and um, facts that might be useful for you. So without further ado, thank you, Bud. So happy to have you here with us tonight. Um, and I'm going to shut my video and be quiet so you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, my name is Bud Scheffel. I am a metal sculptor, kinetic mobiles, stabiles, and large-scale commission uh, works of art, mainly in metal. Sometimes I do uh, dabble in some other materials, but I am known uh, for my metal mobiles. So I guess the, the best way to start this out is most people are intrigued about what a mobile is, how it functions, how they're made, and what applies uh, to the aesthetics of uh, mobile design and composition. Primarily, mobiles are a math and science thing. Uh, the art, composition, and design are kind of afterthoughts, even though it's considered an art form and founded by an artist from the early part of the 20th century named Alexander Calder, he was really the developer of this art form, uh, and he was most popular through the 1930s, through about 1960s into the 1970s, passed away in the middle of that decade. Um, he was coming back, he was coming from an engineering background. So even though it was founded as a mobile design and sculpt uh, sculpting has been uh, labeled an art form, You'll notice that there are not many mobiles around and there are not many mobile artists around and there sure are not many mobile artists that are at an expert level. And the reason being is that it really is an analytical uh, process that gets them done, not so much a creative process. However, the creative component is about a third um, necessary with math and physics being the other two. So I'm going to just go through the fundamentals of what, what the basic uh, structure of a mobile consists of, how it works in tandem uh, with the design elements, and how you gather some mathematical and scientific terms you'll all be familiar with. So I'll keep it as simplified as possible, 
but some of these words will be needed in descriptive measures so you understand what and how it is that they're they're made. So let's start out with the most important component, which is the cantilever. I'm actually going to show you this larger one, uh, which will uh, give you a good understanding in this silhouette against my white backdrop. This cantilever is um, the main structure of the mobile. In every way, shape, and form, this is prerequisite and necessary to suspend objects on either side. I actually made these tools for this presentation so you can understand what it is that I'm holding here. You'll notice that this is a, a really long, elongated, uh, tapered shape. It's a very long, rigid uh, piece of sheet metal cut out by a sophisticated laser. If I turn it on its side, you'll see that it's a flat piece of metal, but stood up on its edge, it's got much of an arc and a series of holes about halfway through the length of the total length of that cantilever. Those holes I put in there are gonna be descriptive and, and uh, fundamental in showing you how the balance points get moved along the cantilever as your weights change. So we'll start with a smaller version of this cantilever, which is basically a, a similar smaller stainless steel variety. Uh, I see myself on the screen, so I can see that this cantilever in the light disappears. So I'll be uh, conscious of that. So we'll take, uh, we'll start out with a very heavy duty stainless steel weight that's gonna sit on the back end of this cantilever. So as you notice, this cantilever has a series of holes throughout uh, its entire length. Once I hang this cantilever, let me make sure I'm not too high here. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna hang, you're gonna notice that that cantilever fulcrum point is almost all the way back in the full length of that lever to allow this heavy weight to be suspended off this very elongated um, lever. So if I add a weight to the other side of this cantilever, you'll notice what happens. So generally, you need to find the balance point depending on the angle you wanna set. In this case, for simple descriptive purposes, I'm gonna just have this uh, parallel to my table below. So as you'll notice that this fulcrum point has to be moved over to a certain point where this cantilever lies horizontal. I'm, I'm getting closer as you can see this dropping now. So this is pretty close to horizontal. So based on the distance from the weight, the back end, the distance traveled will be in the indicative of the total weight, which is on the other side. This is a quarter inch uh, sheet of, of stainless steel. This is a 16th of an inch stainless steel. So with that math calculation, that will determine that approximately 10% of that cantilever is where that fulcrum is. And you can pretty much identify that that's about the distance travel for that fulcrum to be established in this horizontal plane. So as, you, as we change the diameter of these shapes, you'll notice again, the readjusting has to take place. So as the shape gets larger or heavier or both, the fulcrum travels towards the weight always. So since this is heavier than the circle prior, we're gonna move this cantilever uh, fulcrum over a couple more steps. So we're back to horizontal again. Now we have a larger disc. What happens when we add even more weight? So we're gonna add another weight in the middle of this. These are all designed for this presentation. So hopefully you can see these clearly. So you'll notice I hung another weight in the center of that large 16th inch stainless steel disc. When I let it go, again, the weight this determines which side of the cantilever drops. You add weight, that cantilever on that end drops. So your fulcrum, which is where this wire is attached to the cantilever, moves towards the weight. So I move one notch, I move two notches and I'm back to horizontal again. So as you add weight, you move the fulcrum towards the weight. 
So to come to uh, to take the next step in complexity, I'm going to take a smaller cantilever yet. Hoping you can see that. And I'm going to put on one end a smaller circle. And I'm going to let, let this fall um, vertical here. I'm going to link these two up. Now this canter, this shorter cantilever also has a series of, of um, adjustable fulcrums. So in this case, I'm going to try and find, I'm going to put my glasses on for this one here. I'm going to put uh, the fulcrum through an area to try and get this cantilever at horizontal. So now this would be considered a second stage of a mobile. This is a smaller cantilever going to attach to a larger cantilever. So I'm gonna hang it on the end of this primary cantilever. This will be considered our secondary. And you'll notice now this is gonna drop considerably towards the heavier weight. So again, the fulcrum moves towards the weight. We're close to horizontal now. So now you can see how a mobile composition could take place. Say we wanted to change the angle of this mobile from horizontal to diagonal and change the angle of the levers to go up. So we're gonna move away from the weight this time and get somewhat of an angle. You can see now that this has an angle to it. Now, of course, the, the other cantilever has to be adjusted also. So you can see how a mobile design right now can change angle very easily just by moving the fulcrum one direction or the other direction. So as you can see, this, this mobile can be literally vertical by moving that fulcrum forward and forward even more. So to add another, uh, complexity to this assembly, we're going to attach another cantilever to it. This one is in um, steel. So you can see now that this is the long one that we showed, that we talked about in the beginning, that's suspending the entire structure of the mobile here. So we're gonna need a significant weight off the back end of this to be able to use any of these fulcrums the first 50% of the primary cantilever. So we got a big old steel ball that'll do that. So once we establish a heavy weight now, this becomes the primary weight, the mobile becomes the secondary weight. The first piece we talked about, I know this probably seems a little bit on the complicated side if you haven't seen a mobile assembled, but uh, this is as simple as it gets. The primary weight that I had originally showed you that quarter inch stainless steel, that was the primary weight until a heavier weight got added. The heavier the weight, that becomes the number one cantilever or primary. The second heaviest component is the secondary, tertiary and so on. So with this one here, I'm just gonna um, find the fulcrum point to, get, to drop this in the angle that the rest of the mobile is in. And you could see how this mobile could take on very easily, I'll see if I can hold it against this white backdrop, a diagonal feel just by dropping that cantilever backwards or forwards, depending on what angle you're shooting for. So let's get a little bit trickier now. You learned the fundamentals of the cantilever and the fulcrum and its adjustability. Let's learn a little bit about diameter, circumference, radius, and so on. So the diameter of the shape, in this particular case, we got a circle. Um, the diameter, of course, is crossing the entire length of the, uh, not the circumference of the circle. So the diameter is gonna determine the weight of the uh, shape. So if we say, for instance, we have a six inch diameter and it's a solid circle, it's got X amount of ounces per square inch or grams in this case because of the thickness and the lightweight of this stainless steel metal. And so these are calculatable or controlled variables is what we call. So depending on the diameter, depending on the thickness, depending on the material's weight per square inch and so on and so forth, it's density. There's a lot of factors that go into play here. 
These determine the control variables. Once you understand what the weights are, you get to, you know, after a certain uh, period of time, many years in this case, the learning curve is uh, measured over a very, very long period of time. Once you understand the controlled variables, then you're able to say, okay, let's do an algorithmic style mobile, do a six inch diameter circle, a five inch diameter circle, a four inch diameter circle, a three inch and so on. Then you can calculate the lever lengths and the, lever, the, the thickness of the material, the wire, its tensile strength, its flexibility, what it can and cannot do, its properties. So I realize that this is a lot of information. And I also realize that that's the purpose and the reason why artists alone cannot make mobiles at any advanced level, because it really is an analytical approach with a math and, and physics uh, origin. Uh, the composition and design, as I mentioned earlier, is the aesthetic component, and that's where the creative process comes into play for your mobile design and composition. So we're going to step it up a little notch here. The next concept we're going to talk about is called a compound pendulum swing. Just like it sounds, compound, meaning more than one. Pendulum, like the pendulum on a clock, tick tock, only this pendulum is going to be inverted, so it's going to be moving upside down, and swing as you understand a swing. So this one is going to have a 12-inch diameter circle with a certain thickness, a certain weight per square inch, and so on. Underneath it, it's going to have a 5-inch diameter circle. That's the counterweight for the primary weight, which is the large circle. This is going to be the establishing factor for what the pendulum can and cannot do. This is the pendulum. If you notice the sickle shape, the arc of this 10 inch radius of this sickle shape is what stores and releases the kinetic energy. Once it links up to this primary weight and its secondary weight, at this point, we're just gonna call this the primary weight because it's an assembly now, so it counts as the total weight. The pendulum itself stores it, the energy in this arc, and it has two fulcrums. I don't know if you can see it there against my white shirt. Maybe you can. There's two points of contact. Those two points of contact allows this pendulum to store and release kinetic energy on those two points. So kinetic sculpture is a perpetual thing. It's something that's designed to move forever or ongoing. So how am I gonna display this pendulum swing? Well, I happen to have a trusty tripod here. A tripod, it's, this is actually a three-sided um, pyramid, although it only has two sides because the one side is cut out so this pendulum swing can swing through it. So I'm gonna assemble this now, the, the bottom of this stabile. A stabile was a, a, um, a, a phrase coined by Marcel Duchamp, who was a friend of Alexander Calder in the 1950s. Uh, and he thought that the mobile term, the mobile applied to the suspended hung forms of art or art forms that Alexander Calder was making. Um, yet the, 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 the uh, static or still or, or kinetic sculptures that were on a ground or on the table needed a different term. So Duchamp coined the term stabiles instead of mobiles. So what we're going to build right now is a stabile. I'm going to push this laptop back a little further so you can see. Okay, so there's the bottom assembly. The primary weight, which consists of two parts. The pendulum that sits on top of this tripod, which has three points of contact as a tripod would. On the top of this pendulum is where the fulcrum point is, right where my finger is. So what the prerequisite here for building a mobile on top of a stabile, the prerequisite or the determining factor is the total weight below pendulum. So it's this assembly that determines what can go up here. So this is a significantly higher level or degree of difficulty for mobile design because now we're dealing with something supporting it from below 
and something suspended from above. And you'll see that in a second. So now we're back to fulcrum cantilever combination. Here you see a series of graphic elements. Each one weighs progressively um, more than the, pr the prior shape. In other words, this component here, the second one from the bottom, weighs X amount of grams more than the first and so on and so forth. So this is an algorithmic a mathematical term most of you are familiar with. Algorithmic is simply a mathematical rhythm. In this case, you can see and identify the shapes by their graphic elements. So with that said, each one of these are linked together and they're, they're double as a cantilever, which is that shape we talked about first. This cantilever is now a graphic element and is a second graphic element, and a third, and a fourth, and so on. So each one of those graphic elements double as a cantilever and a graphic element. It's a very interesting uh, mobile design for this stabile that we're gonna be assembling right now. So this mobile has a secondary component. That's a thick piece of stainless steel. That's the secondary component, or in this case, the counterweight. So this should be able to be hung from a single contact point. Let me move this table over uh, or the space over a second. So you can see how that mobile is suspended all by itself with its secondary counterweight. So to get an equal and opposite reactionary style mobile, I made two of them just for this display. So I have a second one here and I'm gonna show you a little clearer so you can see what I'm talking about. What I wanted to do to get some height to this stabile assembly with this mobile as being one of two symmetrical components, I'm going to add a vertical cantilever. It, it poses a different problem now because I'm going in the opposite direction that a cantilever would normally go, which is with a trajectory, as you saw on the cantilevers earlier in the presentation, they had an arc. An arc has, a, has the um, direction of um, a gravity formed uh, shape. In other words, the arcs are always predispositioned to end up back to Earth. So it has the assistance of gravity, an arc, where a ray, a vertical ray, is going up or out or diagonal and doesn't have the assistance of gravity. So the tension in a vertical or a horizontal or diagonal cantilever has much more tension built in it, thus in increasing the degree of difficulty in building whatever structure it is you're building. So this is the assembly that I've chosen. It has a copper piece at the top. I don't know if you can see very clearly. I'm not sure you can see too, too clearly that. It's about a, a foot and a half long vertical cantilever with the mobile assembly at the bottom. Since I had made two of those, they're gonna be joined by yet another cantilever. So I'm gonna move this right out of the way so you can see this um, structure. This is a very complex structure I'm holding in my hand right here. So you can see that it has symmetry, identical symmetry. It doesn't have to have symmetry in composition and design. It only has to have same weight, similar weight or in this case, identical weight. So the mobiles don't have to be identical. As long as the weights are equal, then the fulcrum can be drawn at 50%. If this weight was 30% um, heavier, then the fulcrum would be 30% closer to the counterweight. This would be considered the weight, the primary weight then. So the fulcrum in this case, since we have equal and opposite um, mobile assemblies on either side of this cantilever, this cantilever, by the way, is the opposite of this cantilever. This cantilever is stood up on its edge. Remember I showed you early on, it's a flat piece of metal that stood up on its edge. So this functions like a truss because the material is on its edge. It's like an I-beam. It's, it's up on its edge where, where rigidity is the primary um, uh, mechanical advantage when the, the, uh, the a cantilever is built up on an, on an edge, where this cantilever is built on its belly or on its side. 
So it's actually the same cantilever rotated 90 degrees. Why did I do that? I did it because this has an arc now, same arc as that cantilever I just had in my hand. But now the arc has um, a belly that it lays on because the fulcrum point is going to sit on a single contact point underneath this cantilever. So why did I do it? This is the reason. Because it has flexion now. Because once the material, any material, steel uh, or otherwise, once it's stood up on its edge, it's rigid times eight. So if it's on its belly, it's zero. On its edge, it's eight. So it's eight times stronger when it stood up on its edge. So I laid it on its belly so I could have flexion. So it's a lot more flexible, this stainless steel, when it's on its belly. Let's bring, let's bring in our, our stable base once again. Hope you're all following along. I'm gonna probably put this against the back lot here so you can see what I'm doing here. So the cantilever has a single contact point on the bottom. It sits on top of that pendulum. It rotates around in symmetry, absorbs the wind's energy centrifugally. The vertical ballast with that copper component at the top, if you remember, these are ballast, B-A-L-E-S-T, as in, as in a boat ballast, where you add or subtract water from a giant boat. When you remove so much weight, uh, you have to remove or add water so the boat doesn't tip over or list into the ocean, right? So this ballast is the same principle. What it does is it absorbs the wind's energy laterally. And that's the reason why I chose a vertical cantilever here, because now it picks up the wind's energy in a different way than this style mobile would or this style cantilever would. So it absorbs the wind's energy laterally, rotationally, centrifugally, and then the secret of the sleeve is the pendulum swing which absorbs the wind's energy in a rocking motion, thus compound pendulum swing term. And that is really a very complex concept in design for uh, a mobile and a stable combination. Let me move over to something else now. Hope you're getting all this. This is a lot of info gathered right now. This uh, algorithmic, an algorithmic style mobile here. So if you can see this, this has three components, a 10 inch disc, an eight inch disc, a six inch disc. They are equal thicknesses. They are equal weight per square inch. They are equidistant. They have a very symmetrical uh, way that they're displayed in that there's a, line, a very clean linear line. Everything is perpendicular, vertical parallel lines, perpendicular cantilevers. This is a really complex mobile, as simple as it looks. Done via algorithm. So there's a very significant mathematical formula that gets this job done, and it's just an equation. Um, let's see, I got another one here. We're pulling out all the stops. I wish I had a lot more room because I'd be able to show you some really cool pieces. So this one is a very interesting assembly. I'm gonna move my computer back a little bit more here. I think we can see some of that. Um, this out of the way. Okay, so this one is interesting. Okay, so this has a, uh, a, a four-point base. This specifically, this specific base and structure you're gonna be looking at now is a model for a 20-foot sculpture that was installed in, a, um, in an institution down here in Florida. So this, this concept is really interesting also. It has a primary weight and a secondary weight, similar to the other stabile we talked about. So it does it is considered the, a composition piece, thus allowing the entire weight of this assembly to be considered the primary weight. Since I wanted not a horizontal or perpendicular mobile uh, sitting on top of the pendulum swing we talked about just now. I wanted this one to have a diagonal. So here is that stainless steel cantilever again. 
look at the interesting shape this is now. So you can see that this is set on a diagonal, just like I'm holding it right now. The stainless steel cantilever is gonna connect the primary weight. I'm hoping this comes through. It looks like it, it, it's okay on the, the video here. I'm gonna move around a little bit. We uh, can see it, bud. You can see it good? Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Just wanna let you know. Looks great. Great, great. thank you. <laughs> All right, so, so here we have a secondary weight. Now we're looking at a little bit of a Calder reminiscence here with the red and black colors. The counterweight for this assembly is this um, cantilever that I have in my hand. It's, it has a reverse, what's called a parabolic arc. It has two arcs, each cons consisting of three points, but this one has five because they share the common center point. So two three-point arcs, one going one direction, one going the other direction, and there's that graceful shape. So that links to the end of this cantilever as its secondary weight. It sits on top of this base on a single contact point. Of course, I don't have my glasses on. So there you have it. This one is set at a diagonal. It can be altered simply by changing the angle or simply by changing the thickness, the diameter, or the total weight of this assembly. Everything is doable with this physics principle. It's just a matter of increasing or decreasing or rescaling components to get you um, modified. So just about any problem you have can be solved by just changing your math formulas there. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, another design here that is um, already assembled. This one has some bright colors on it. The bottom assembly, if you look really carefully, I'm going to hold it up closer to the laptop there. It has three heavy duty horizontal discs and a big chunk of steel at the bottom. This entire structure here at the bottom is the primary weight. So it, its total weight determines what can be placed above it. So fortunately, there's a lot of weight there. That allows this mobile to be constructed. I don't know if you could see the wires too closely from this the, um, distance. The, the secondary uh, cantilevers are these shooting out trajectory style cantilevers in all different colors. Its final weight is in reverse. It's this moon or crescent shape that's actually a three-dimensional shape that finishes off in opposite direction of the, of the majority of those levers. So these mobiles are all based on similar principles that have unlimited potential. Uh, you can really, um, I'm working on several projects right now that are going to be in the 25 to 30 foot range. And simply by uh, taking the fundamentals that you just learned about and supersizing them and scaling them up according to your understanding and knowledge of what the materials can do, how long your lever can be, how thick of a material or how high a density or tensile strength a lever that's 10 feet long, that has a 50 pound weight on one side and a 25 pound weight on the other side can just be simply by doing some math calculations. So I think that's gonna be about it for me. I hope you all enjoyed the bit about mobile making tonight. I think we can ask uh, at this point, uh, as far as uh, any questions that you may have regarding the assembly, composition, design, or math and physics principles relating to the construction of mobiles and stabiles. Anyone have any questions? Bud, that was great. Um, uh, so I just want to ask people to put their questions in the Q and A. Um, and I wonder when you first started doing this work, 
did you start from a mathematical end or did you start playing around with the weight, seeing if it would balance and then figured out that you needed the science behind it? Or did you well, begin? That's a very good question. You know, I, I, I get it all the time in my career because it is a strange combination of disciplines to have the left brain, right brain, my right brain kind of work together with a scientific side and a math uh, and an art side. So I did go to school for art, but I was a math and science. Um, I had a lot of interest in math and science, but I ended up in the arts in the advertising commercial art industry, which kind of honed in my graphic design skills, which a lot of this uh, uh, applies to for sure. Um, but the math and, and physics end of it was from my father, who was an engineer type gentleman. And uh, I always had a love for the tricky fundamentals of uh, problem solving. So it worked, it was a good fit for me for a career choice. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, Denise Pettit is asking, do you work out the weights before you create the designs? Mo most people, their thought processes are logical and reasonable by assuming that it's a trial and error thing. Although this uh, question, um, it doesn't pose that. Uh, many people think this is a trial and error thing, but the, the question just asked, really, it is a fundamental predetermined calculus thought process that gets done way ahead of time. As long as I have a, a fundamental design composition in mind, then yes, those weights are figured and factored ahead of time. I, I understand what weight I need to achieve to make this lever this long and the mobile this big. So I have to choose X amount of weight. So I, I, I go back to my math skills there. Okay, thank you for that. Tom Updike is asking, what metals do you use for exterior mobiles? If stainless steel, can this be painted? Yes, uh, stainless steel is the primary material I use for all my framing and all of the cantilevers and important components for the simple reason that it doesn't rust. Uh, and I use a marine grade stainless since the stainless steel has a variable of iron uh, traces in it. The higher grade stainless steel you use, the less iron. And once you get to marine grade stainless, it cannot rust. So that's the primary material used for outside. And then aluminum is often used because that also doesn't rust and um, uh, brass and copper often as well because their natural uh, oxidized process takes over there. Well, that's great. A um, couple of things. Mary Schwarzenberger says, fascinating. Thank you. Jennifer Howell says, your work is beautiful. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, what kind of metal is in your wire? Is it stainless? Yeah, the, the wire is made up of two um, elements, it is chrome and nickel. And as I mentioned, iron is that third component, and that's only uh, in uh, inexpensive stainless wire, which I, I do not bother with. Stainless wire is definitely the number one material for outdoor mobile design, for sure. Great, thank you. Arlene Rubin is, as, is saying a fabulous presentation and beautiful. Um, then Gail Trotter is asking, what if you mix materials that weather differently? Well, actually a lot of my customers really do like the combination of mixing copper. You can see that oxidized finish there. It's a beautiful material. It's elemental, which means no other um, material in there other than the element copper. The steel components are a variety of different irons, um, cold rolled, hot rolled, different types of steel has this organic rusted uh, look. Many people do not like it. Many people do. And many of my customers like the three materials together, stainless steel, copper and the organic look of uh, rusted steels. So they're, they're often used in, in unison. Uh, well, thank you for that. Sashka Ross is saying, I love the compactness and speed with which you laid all this out. Good presentation. 
<laughs> and there's a lot of work that went into it. Um, Tom Updike says, great presentation. What do you use for connectors that allow the components to move? Um, most of the graphic elements are, are used with hand forged stainless steel hooks of sorts. But the primary one to answer your question is the stainless steel ball bearing made of only uh, chromium stainless steel. The ball bearings inside the casing, which is, I don't have any uh, large enough to show you, would be far too small. Uh, it's the ball bearings are cased, they're like BBs uh, encased in a cylinder and the, the cylinder rotates around these uh, metal stainless steel balls and that allows for little to no friction and the mobile to move very easily and glide uh, beautifully. Wonderful, um, thank you. The anonymous attendee is saying, when you connect your wires with heat, do you weld or braze? Neither. I do not, I am a welder, but I do not weld. Uh, and I, I do braze, but not in the case of making mobiles. I don't know if you really looked, uh, you couldn't see really too carefully, but, uh, or, or too in detail, that the majority, if not nearly 100% of my items are sheet metal engineering. There is no welding on anything that I do here. Even in, in the case of something like this, and this airfoil, this airfoil is cut out with a high uh, speed laser machine that gives the silhouette. And then it has a score along the spine here that allows it to be bent into a symmetrical wing shape. The wing would be an inverted uh, vertex facing down would be a wing. First vertex facing up is an airfoil. So in this case, it's all sheet metal engineering. There's no welding on anything, including the cantilevers or any of the uh, graphic elements. They're all uh, linked together with a series of hooks and so on. Fabulous. Uh, Jennifer Krasinowicz is asking, do you have your own CNC or laser, laser metal cutting table or do you draw and send out your elements to a shop to be cut? Both. I have limitations on my equipment. Uh, the larger commissioned uh, works that I am in, uh, I'm doing on a regular basis now, I do farm out for several reasons, mainly that the larger shops have uh, significantly more um, uh, industrial equipment that I need for large, larger proje projects that I don't own. So a little bit of both uh, to that answer to that question. That's great. Um, another question is, do you have any particular visual inspirations? I'm sorry, visual? Yes. Do you have what? Where do you get your inspiration from? Like, yeah, um, I, I find a lot in nature. Uh, I, I recognize that things like branches of trees or, or shapes of leaves, uh, sometimes in, uh, in, in industrial uh, locations or architecture buildings, old old school or old world architecture. I often draw inspiration from a lot of different um, uh, periods of art and uh, and all through the natural world for sure. That's great. As a uh, as a child born in the '60s, I had a Calder mobile hanging over my crib. <laughs> wow. <laughs> a little paper one. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so Anthony uh, Cordasco is, PV Cordasco is asking, how do you allow for wind gusts like 50 or 70 miles per hour when things are? Sure. Uh, very good question. Uh, well, I built a wind tunnel uh, 48 inch by 48 inch decades ago to test uh, the, the velocity of the wind, the direction of it and so on um, for smaller mobiles. And uh, usually I can scale the, the math up and do a calculation uh, and come up with a relatively accurate um, rating. So at this point right now, the majority, 95% of my mobiles are made with a special high density stainless that we talked about. And there are chain uh, stainless steel chain link system not unlike a, uh, a chain link fence. So once the, once the, uh, the links are completed and 
and the arcs are, are complete and the links have been closed, uh, it's very unlike a wind gust could uh, open those because they're high density, high tensile. So with that said, the mobiles that are uh, up to about four feet have a 50 mile an hour wind rating, over four feet, uh, up to about 65 mile an hour wind rating. Gale force is just about the limitations of anything that I make, including the larger uh, kinetic sculptures for the ground. That makes a lot of sense. Even our patio furniture will move at 60 miles per hour. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> um, Lynn Bradley says, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so to anyone who has additional questions, look in our chat, you can go to Bud's website directly and contact him there. If you'd like to watch this again or share it with your friends in the next couple of days, it will be posted on our Peters Valley YouTube channel. Um, so you can rewatch it and think about fulcrums and, and counterweights. Um, and thank you so much, Bud. This was really fascinating and we love your work and we hope to see you at our craft fair this fall. Thank you. I shall be there. Thank you so much for your time tonight, and I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.